Well, good morning. Thank you for letting me come and speak. Um, no pressure being the first speaker on the first day of this first conference ever. So um, we've got standby people to catch me if I pass out. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll keep it light, keep it entertaining. And you guys, please have any questions by all means, uh, definitely ask them at the end of it. Can I just by a show of hands, how many are uh, private sector business here with business or manufacturing or companies? How many people are educators, teachers, and students? All right. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll tie all this together for you. But so I'm going to kind of cross a lot of different things with the future of manufacturing, what that looks like, uh, and that's in through the eyes of, of the Maker Mobile. Um, and as you, as she said, as as you walked in, hopefully you saw it, and we'll open it up after the talk and, and go from there. So um, just real quick, a little bit of background. Um, Sam Tech is is where I work. Um, it's a full-time job there where we make electronic components. Um, we are one of the top ten in the world of electronic components, cables, fiber optics. We package chips. We create all kinds of stuff. Um, so most of our stuff is inside the box. Our customers range from anybody from Facebook to Google to Cisco um, to the university. So we have a broad uh, spectrum of customers uh, and we're located in southern Indiana. Southern Indiana may not be known for the technology hub of the world, um, but we pr push a lot of technology. So our customers that come to our headquarters there in New Albany, it's a private business um, that really tries to push the leading edge of what we're doing in technology. Uh, we're one of the few companies in the world right now that is actually, we're creating fiber optic engines that will sit on top of chips, processors, that will go in the giant server farm. So if you think speeds are fast with your computers now, when you turn it into light speed, you, you can't go much faster than that. So as quick as you can play on your phone and pull up a Facebook page, you could do that 5, 10, 100 times faster when everything goes into light. So that's why the technology is so important, and that's why I'm involved with what we do, um, and that's why we built the MakerMobile. So um, Samtech is a global company, and why this is important for the future of manufacturing is because the world is pretty flat when it comes to manufacturing. And what's really neat about what's coming down the pipeline is that the, uh, the labor rate that would once took jobs away from the states is now being leveled because the labor is now being offset by advanced manufacturing tools, robots, ma uh, machines, automation, and stuff like that. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is now coming back to the states. So where Samtech is a global company and we're spread across, we're, we're that way for logistics. Because we want people in Asia, we want to be able to ship our product from that area within it. Because our stuff is small components, and it might cost more than the product is to make to ship it around the world. So it's really starting to level out the playing field of manufacturing across the globe. And there are a lot of more companies coming back to the states. And another part of that is what we're seeing up in southern Indiana is um, we've got a pretty good tie with the international ports. We're also on the Ohio River. Um, like Companies in Japan, they can't expand anymore. They're out of room. They're an island, right? So they are coming back to the States. They're bringing their companies. So we're getting a lot more international companies starting to look at places in the, in the more rural areas because, I mean, you've got a good workforce. You've got strong wor workers. Um, and so now we need to raise the technology to kind of match the jobs that are coming back to the States. So why is manufacturing uh, and technology important? Um, especially here in kind of the Midwest, uh, around the, the Ohio River and, and such, uh, we are some of the biggest manufacturing powerhouses. In Indiana, uh, we have the highest percent of any state in the country of, of percent of manufacturing jobs. Kentucky's up there in the top 10 as well. Um, and so of the 100, you know, of the 200 something plus thousand jobs, and this was from a, a, about a year and a half ago census, um, you know, half of those are in this eastern side of the state. So there's a decent amount of manufacturing here, and so now you have a good base to build on, so hopefully these companies will start looking and coming back. Now you've got to have the education and the technology to back that. So kind of how all this comes together, and I'll bounce around a little bit and try to tie this together, is um, to get the, uh, the, the future of manufacturing, we have to have that foundation. We have to create the educational foundation that ties into the manufacturing. And then we have to get that access. We have to give that access to the future workers, the kids, the, the students, and all that. So where 
you have the ability to have those tools in your hands so that you know how to work with this technology and then you can improve it, you can change it. Then you take your imagination, that turns into innovation, and then it turns into machines and manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. So you have to have that support and that's what this conference is all about is to kind of expose you guys to different technologies, the emerging technologies and what's coming down the line and what you guys could see here in the future um, and to get you excited about it because it really is, there's really cool stuff happening out there. So part of that, as technology changes, as manufacturing changes, the tools evolve. Everything changes. So she already mentioned the 3D printers and you'll see some of those out there. And what we say is, don't go too fast there. Um, there's a saying out there, and I think it was coined to JFK, but it came from another history, but a rising tide lifts all ships. So as technology advances, it's going to con continue to push the technology. It's going to continue to push all the private sector, all the businesses, everything on, it, on its way. So as new things get introduced into the manufacturing and technology, then everything changes. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a little bit. So what is advanced manufacturing? The definition changes all the time. This is the official government uh, definition. Um, I can send this to you, you can read it later, but what it really means and what we say in the Makermobile is you're just using really cool equipment to make stuff. That's what advanced manufacturing is. So you could go back to the big long definition and again that changes based on the time period and based on what's available, um, but really it's after just making stuff with really cool equipment and having that equipment do all the work for you. So what is the Maker Mobile? Why is it important? Why are we here? What do we do? Um, as you saw as you came in, hopefully, it's a, it's a giant modified car hauler. Um, and we, we created it as a, a collaboration. If you guys haven't heard of a company called Tech Shop, um, they're kind of a, a, a statewide or across the country uh, maker space. And so what that is, is a, a makerspace is somewhere where somebody can come in as a member, like the YMCA or something like that. Uh, and instead of working out on uh, like a treadmill or bikes, you're working out on lasers and 3D printers and technology and stuff like that. So it's, it's a full wood shop, metal shop, all that stuff. And that's really what we're building out in southern Indiana. So my wife, Christy, and I and, and another couple, another engineer, um, we're building out the same model in southern Indiana. Um, so the Maker Mobile is kind of the front runner of that. It's to get out into the community um, and really just reach different pockets of the community and, and get people excited about this future in making and, and manufacturing. So we had, we were, uh, we were blessed with a couple private foundations that uh, put in money to create this. And so when this all came together, this wasn't part of a grant, this wasn't part of an education system, this was ma people in manufacturing and people in community foundations that said, hey, there is, there is a lack of technology. There's a lack of this uh, skilled labor and, and skilled workforce coming up through schools. How do we get them excited about that? It takes the school system sometimes a little too long to get technology back into the schools. By the time it goes up and gets curriculum built back to the schools, it might be too late. So the private foundations got together. Uh, they put up the money and in less than two months they, uh, they said we want you to debut at the Idea Fest up in Louisville uh, back in 2014 uh, and they gave us two months to do that. So in two months we got the trailer, we, we, we designed out the trailer and built it out and hopefully you like what you see when you come out there. Um, but we do tie in to um, our community schools and, and um, community tech schools. Uh, we tie into them as well because that's the outlet of who comes on the trailer who comes on the maker mobile? Where do they go for that education? We need to be able to point them to places where they can get that education and get those degrees, get those uh, certificates or whatever they need. Um, so it's a big community involvement, a community tie, and this just drives around to all of them. So if a school can't have a maker space or if a, a community doesn't have a space like that or a, or a shop, most of the schools in southern Indiana and Kentucky have done away with shop class and home ec, and so kids aren't even exposed to this stuff. And so the future of shop class may look completely different if it does come back and hopefully it'll look something like what we have on the, on the trailer. So our mission is just to expose the community to this stuff. So we drive around, we want to get as many people excited about it and plugged into where they can even learn about it um, and, and get their hands on the tools. Um, because once you have your hands on the tools and see how easy it is to run the tools, 
um, the, the point of entry and the, the, um, the, the, the skill classes that you need is, is, is gone. Uh, it's all right there in front of you. So we do, yeah, we, we drive around to the schools any age. We've been down to elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges. We've been to craft shows. We've been to weekend farmer's market type of things. Uh, anybody has access to this stuff. So the same older gentleman that has a little craft booth at a, a farmer's market, we can have them running a laser in like 20 minutes. And then they can take what they've been making in their craft in their booth for so long and add something to it. Take it to that next level. Or we can take it to an elementary school or a Cub Scout tr uh, pack. Um, I think we built maybe 50 to 100 Pinewood Derby cars. We laser etched all kinds of stuff. We put laser flames down the side of these Pinewood Derby cars and they were way over engineered to roll down the track. But the kids had a great time. They were actually the ones pushing the buttons on the machines and, 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 and doing all this for their, their Pinewood Derby. So this is just a quick little list, and, and again, we want to invite you guys out to see this stuff, but um, on board we have a couple lasers, the CO2 lasers, uh, a couple 3D printers, a ShopBot uh, is a CNC router, so it's just a computer-controlled router. Um, the, the workstations, we have everything is run off of just laptops. Uh, a lot of stuff you could even run, you could send files to from your cell phone if you really wanted to. So there is no programming secret uh, class that you have to take to run this stuff. Uh, it, it is just as easy as, you know, uploading a file on your phone, send it over to the, the machine and hit and go. So uh, we also have soldering irons and, and workstations and stuff like that to where we can actually do electronics and solder stuff up too if we wanted to. So maybe next year for the Pinewood Derbies, we'll start soldering up LED headlights and stuff like that. And I, I don't know if we'll be able to put motors on them, but we'll, we'll try. Uh, and so what a maker mobile, you've, you may have seen the term and heard what a, a maker is. It's kind of a, a, a new term. Um, this is, the, again, the official long definition of what a maker is. It's really not that complicated. For the maker mobile, it's someone who likes to be creative and make things. It's that, that difficult. Um, so when we were starting to do all this stuff, I would, I would talk to my grandpa who's 92 years old and say, hey, there's this new thing, it's a maker. And he would just laugh because he said, you know, back on the farm, you had, there was no choice but to make things and repair things and fix things. And so we've, we've made, technology has been good, that's made it so easy access for all this equipment and tools, um, but it's taken our hands out of being creative and making things. And so we haven't been kind of self-sufficient on, on how we create and build things. And so it's kind of, a, uh, it's, it's riding the wave. We're back to where we need to be supporting ourselves and making things. Um, but now we can use that technology that was the big wave that, that waved over, uh, and now we can actually apply that to how we build stuff. So that's why we keep in the traditional methods as well as the advanced manufacturing. It reminds me of the formulas and stuff that you have to learn in college and high school and stuff. You've got to learn the formulas, you've got to learn this, you've got to learn the base, you've got to be able to do this by hand before you can use your calculator. And so that was the craziest thing that I, when I took the engineering school and calculus. They said for the first three years, no calculators. You have to do everything by hand, everything with equations, write it out on paper. So you have to understand the base, the foundation, so that then when you get the technology, you can take it and run with it. And then you can actually take that technology and repurpose it and tweak it and change it, and that pushes the technology forward. So who is a maker? Again, that's not really complicated. It talks about a community of, of makers and stuff. It's somebody who makes things. Whether you're a baker and you like to make cupcakes, or whether you're a woodcrafter and like to carve out things, or whether it's your full-time job, and that's the key point here is you can make a really good living being a maker. Uh, the skilled trades, the vocation, the manufacturing, uh, as that comes back, those are very well-paying jobs, and they're sought after. Uh, as these tools and as this advanced technology comes back, People don't know how to program and people don't know how to wire them up. So an electrician is just as valuable as the engineer designing the part because if you can't put them together, it doesn't matter how good the design is, you need that whole support structure all the way down. So the emerging technologies doesn't mean that everybody goes and, and has to get an engineering degree or designer or something like that. Uh, it, it needs that full foundation of the education to the, the machine tool and die guys, uh, the electrician, the PLC programmers, uh, so it needs that whole breadth of offering of, of education. So as you guys, the younger people that are either in school or getting ready to sign up for classes, 
look at those options. There's a lot of options out there, and there's those skills and those uh, pay rates are coming up to match and actually exceed a lot of uh, standard college graduation rates. So people might come out with a college education and get one pay. You could go to a trade school and learn to be a tool and die apprentice and probably make more than, than half the guys coming out of college now. But there's a balance. You have to have both. So how does this all tie together? Let's see if I can bounce it all together. So the future of manufacturing depends on emerging technologies. Emerging technologies is based off of how you change and build into the advanced manufacturing. That all comes from innovators, from builders, from creators, from the makers. And hopefully the maker mobile is feeding into the makers. So all this is tied together. Uh, it all is a progression and it all has to work together as one system. So the future of manufacturing, it's, it's building into a lot more advanced manufacturing, and it's going to only continue to grow and continue to push. So this may be an information overload, but it's, it's, uh, that's what's in the world today. Everybody has access to everything, whether you got a smartphone or the internet or anything. You have access to all the information you could possibly want. And if you don't have it, you can find somebody that's got it. So with all that information at, at people's fingertips, what do you do with it now? Uh, so we need to reintroduce the physical tools and we do that kind of with a twist with the maker mobile is showing how it can be fun and how it can, you can do silly things with it to, from time to time but that all feeds back into the advanced manufacturing and making things in, in that, that part of it. So again I kind of circle back to this as how all those things were tied together. Uh, it, it, that's the rising tide. That's every time something new comes out in, in advanced manufacturing and the emerging technologies, it lifts everything up. So it continually to rise, raise the tide. So what are things in the past that you may have, what were game changers that really pushed the limits? Probably the first and, and one of the biggest is the printing press. Uh, there was a magazine called The Atlantic that did a, a top 50 innovations in the history. Uh, and, and the printing press was at number one. Why? Because that gave technology, that started to, not just technology, that started put, taking that education. When you could start printing and mass producing books and, and whatever was in that book, you could, you could share. Now you could take it. So instead of riding a horse to your neighbor's house to tell them that you had a kid last week, uh, you can send an email. You can send it on email. If it's on Facebook, everywhere. So starting to push that information, starting to share that information, uh, it all started with the printing press, right? Uh, that really started to mass produce that stuff, to really get it out into the, into the world. Other innovations that kind of changed the tides of manufacturing and, and technology, the assembly line. To do the assembly line, all the pieces had to now be redesigned to, to fit together in an assembly line fashion, where before everything was a one-off handmade piece of item. Where once you got into the assembly line, that not only changed the, the product to market, the time to market, uh, it changed how the products were designed. It changed how the products were, were used. Um, and it changed the, the access to, to people to get the products. So that was a big game changer. That pushed the technology forward too. So once you had the assembly line, that's when things started. You tried to automate things or batch things together. And so that pushed the automation and pushed that down years later. So, and, and not only that, but it pushed uh, probably the next one maybe a little bit better. Like the steam engine. Once you put the steam engine was, was before, but you put the steam engine on an assembly line, start automating things, where it might have taken you know, a few guys to, to pull something or to move something, and you could hook it up to a steam engine. This also changed how steel was produced. I mean, once you started making all these things, how do you support making the new products? How do you support making that advanced technology? And so this was, this was huge when it came out. Um, and so there's different game changers. Now, now Current times, uh, silicon, uh, the internet, microprocessors and all that stuff, it's a whole nother game changer. So the information technology, now the speed at which we transfer technology and all that is, is completely different. And so what I mentioned with some of the stuff that Samtech does about, you know, we're taking information that comes out of that chip and turn it into light speed and turn it out the information and it's going just as fast as you could ever want it to go. Uh, so these are all big game changers in technology that enable the tools, that enable the 3D printing, that enable the advanced manufacturing, the automation and machines and stuff. All these build together and they're a continuation of, of how it grows. And so this is the tide 
continuing to push forward and continuing to lift up. So on the trailer, one of the things, CNC control, if you guys know what CNC is, computer numerically controlled, just means you're, the computer is telling the, the robot what to do for you. So CNC operations are, are enabled by the processors, by the electronics, by the chips, because now you take those hand tools, so if anybody's familiar with a hand router, um, or even go back a step farther, a chisel. So the first process was chiseling out a piece of wood. If you wanted to build a log cabin, you would get a chisel and saw, and you would uh, hand hewn out those logs and build the log cabin. Well, then you started getting a, a, a drill bit, and you, so you then now you put a motor on it, and now you put a motor on that motor to where it will run and control whatever you want. Uh, so now you can use that to run all your equipment. A 3D printer is a CNC machine. Uh, this little router system is just kind of a small little woodworking machine. And so any model, any file that you can find, uh, any 3D object, really for this software, you drag it over into the software and you tell it how deep you want to cut it and how big you want to make it and what bit you're cutting with. That's all the programming you need to be a CNC operator of a woodworking machine. So the point of entry to this stuff, it, it's, it's gone. It's, it's completely leveled out because it's more of a conversational piece. And that's what a lot of this advanced technology and, and uh, uh, these computerized equipment and stuff is, is all uh, conversational type of, of programming. So as opposed to in the past where there was lines of code that you had to manipulate and change the lines of code to type in whatever you needed to do, all you do is answer a few questions. How thick's the piece of wood you're cutting? What's the bit you got? And where's the file? That's about it. So uh, we use ours out on the Makermobile. So we have this miniature one. It's a little desktop one. Uh, and we'll be running some stuff later on today. Uh, feel free, stop out and see what we're doing. Um, and then, so again, I mentioned that CNC control just means you've got different axes that are moving. So the X, Y, and Z axis are all run on, on rails. They're all run on, on, uh, on guides. And uh, so the same thing that runs uh, like a printer. See the little ribbon running back and forth? You can take those off and put them on machines like this and run more or less the same thing. And that's kind of how the 3D printers work. So uh, it'll be kind of hard to see, but I'll show you some examples of stuff where if you can see this in the back. So this was done on our laser. And I'm going to show you this to guide into the 3D printing. And if you can see, this is all done out of cardboard. They're all individual layers of cardboard. And so the software, all we did was download a free file and we said slice it and there's free software for all this. And we'll tell you all about it if you stop out there. But you say I've got this thick of cardboard and this big of a cut bed, go. And it turns it into a 3D puzzle. So a smaller form factor might look like just pieces. And so the file, it also, it will number them. It numbers them, tells you where it goes. And so now you build this whole entire model. And so I would do this by hand where I would stack it together. But what the 3D printer does is it does that with plastic. And so it'll actually deposit plastic and then raise the layer and deposit another layer of plastic. And so there's, there's a few out here on the exhibitor tables. There's a few out on the trailer. Um, but take a look at it. Now, this, doing this by hand is, is pretty quick. A 3D printer might not be as quick. But you see the resolution of this is the layers. So the same way you might change the resolution of a picture, uh, the, the higher the resolution, the bigger the file, the slower it might be. So the higher the resolution for a 3D printer, it's not really fast. But the resolution is great. It's exactly what you want it to be. You can change it to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters thick uh, each layer, where this is probably about uh, 0 0.1 inches thick. Yeah. No. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so the 3D printer, that's an additive manufacturing to where this is, we cut these out of cardboard uh, and then we stack them on top of it. Where the 3D printer, the additive manufacturing, is it starts with nothing and starts building these up. And so it's building them from nothing. There's no waste. It's using exactly what you want to do. And so this is great. We promote this for, for uh, prototypes, for entrepreneurs, for first off builds. At Samtech, we use it for any of our tools that we're going to build. Uh, we'll 3D print it first, make sure it fits. We'll put it on the assembly line and run it uh, before we spend a lot of money on, on tooling it up. So if, if a 3D printed part, it may take, say, four or five hours or maybe even 10 or 12 hours. But you get exactly what you want, the exact resolution you want, and the cost of the material is pennies. So to print something, uh, something this big would take a while, but I mean, 
cost of material, even for something like that is a, with a 3D printer, might be a, a few dollars. If I was to machine this out of wood, metal, whatever, you're looking at, at hundreds of dollars, right? To get that contours, the, the detail, uh, it's, it would take time and it would take a lot of money to do that. So the 3D printer is like instant access, uh, instant gratification of your design. If it doesn't work, you spin it and you print a new one. And so that's what we've learned to do on, on a lot of the 3D printers for prototypes and for first off builds is that if we're having trouble with it, we print it, test it. If it doesn't work, make your modifications, print it again. Now you're not wasting a lot of money on, on tooling it up where you have to send it out, cut it out of steel, cut it out of metal. Uh, so this is instant, uh, instant access to the tools. So on the trailer we have, we call it type A machines. And these type of machines were actually designed in maker spaces. Uh, so similar to the shop that we're building out, the tech shop that I mentioned, uh, these guys started there just as a hobby. They had an, a, like a, a mix of uh, 3D printer parts and they actually laser cut out their first boxes and self-wired up their controls. And then once they started, they actually sold those out of that shop, built the business, created the business, and then they graduated up to the metal framework that you'll see out on the trailer. And now they're one of the better 3D printers out there. Uh, the biggest build area, you can do a full cubic foot. You could almost print most of, of Abe Lincoln up here um, on that 3D printer. So these are a couple of little quotes uh, that I found from, from some different articles um, about technology and about how everything moves forward. Um, it really, it, it's the interactions between getting the access to tools to people and their interactions and how they perceive it, how they use it. So it's, it's really from the bottom up. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can only rely so much on the great thinkers and scientists that are locked away in a, in a building somewhere and just cranking out stuff. That still works to a degree, but the majority of stuff, the majority of innovations, the majority of technology really comes from once people get access to tools, they're playing around with stuff, they tinker with it, and it's getting that, uh, the mindset of, you know, not all engineers are the best designers. Uh, it's really, it's somebody that has a problem. If somebody's trying to solve a problem, trying to make their lives better, or make something easier on their selves, they're going to be innovative. Uh, they're going to be the ones that, that create that. So it's not limited. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a, a, a physicist or, or whatever. Um, you just have to be creative. You just have to think of other ways to do a job, other ways to do a, a, a project. Um, so if we, we look at the technology, that rising tide, all that stuff, uh, you know, you have your, your great thinkers that are kind of on the outskirts, the outliers of the bell curve kind of deal, uh, where the most of us live right in the middle. We're kind of just, you know, we're, we're getting this technology, we're trying to figure it out, but what happens is the more people, more technology builds into that little bell curve, it, the whole thing's going to shift. And so that's where the rising tide shifts the whole technology curve. Uh, once you get access to these things, it changes how things are developed, it changes how things are built and designed. So where do we go from here? Uh, as I mentioned, the Makermobile was private foundations. It was private sector stuff. The private sector is so much more of a driver for innovation now than these big government agencies and these big private sectors and these big, you know, uh, Ivy League colleges that are, that are just cranking away at research and stuff like that, those are all needed because those feed back into that, that, that technology bell curve. Um, but really, the private sector is who's driving this stuff. And that's why, again, the Makermobile was designed and built by private sector people um, because they have that need. They're the ones that are pushing the technologies into the, into the products that we're building. Um, and so it's going to be driven more by private sectors than it is through um, big, big agencies, more or less. But they do have to work hand in hand. So it's not one is better than the other, one is not. They're just different and they work together hand in hand. Uh, so schools, they have to tie into industry. And that's what we try to do with the Makermobile again is tie it back to manufacturers who use these tools. Uh, we, we love to partner up with a manufacturer and say, on, you know, we're here at this school on behalf of, of this company who uses these tools and will pay you very well if you get an education in these tools. Uh, and so we love to be able to connect that back and forth and to get industry to come in and do talks and industry to come in and, and talk about what they're doing and what technology and breakthroughs are coming through at their doors. Uh, that, that just 
spurs on and, and kind of um, justifies what you're learning in school. Had I known some of the things I was doing now when I was in school, I probably would have taken some different classes or paid a little bit more attention in some other classes. But you don't know that. And so that's why getting plugged into the industry and, and having that kind of cross-pollination of, of what's actually being used hands-on out in the field, um, that's so important. And so if you guys have a chance when you go to school, I, I would uh, advise you guys, if you can, take, do a co-op or an intern or summer work at, at these companies. Uh, because now you get the application of what you're learning. Because it's, it's so much fun to sit in classes and just look at books and take tests all day long. It's the greatest thing ever, right? Uh, but when you actually get out into the field and you're like, oh, this is, this is kind of why I learned this. And now I can apply it to this. And now you have your hands in those tools and are actually building and changing what's, what's being developed. Uh, and so that's part of the, the, the project with the Maker Mobile as well. Get tools and technology in the hands of people everywhere. Again, I said we mentioned we, we went to uh, craft fairs, we went to flea markets and all that stuff. And so if, if something, as you guys build out your, your trailer, uh, your STEM trailer, uh, I would urge you guys, you know, don't just focus on, on the, the middle schools and high schools, but, but get everybody. And if, if you guys are, are, are lucky enough to, to get a maker space or a community shop, you gotta open it up to everybody. Uh, because you're going to get some knowledge from a, maybe an, a, an old school retired machinist that knows every way that you can build and cut apart. And if he's talking to an entrepreneur, he's going to give them insight on how to build something and how to do something that they may, they may have never thought about. And so that's what we're so excited about about the makerspace that we're building out in southern Indiana is the cross, the cross uh, culture that's coming in there, different backgrounds. You know, if we have teachers coming in, if we have educators, if we have machinists, if we have nurses and doctors, if we have students, everybody's going to see a problem a little differently. And so if you can have a community space where people can actually work together and talk together like that, um, or if you can take a trailer out to these places, uh, you'll find a lot more solutions to, to problems that you, you may not have even known existed. Uh, so the create the community workspace, uh, the, the trailer that you guys are building out that, that is being built out here is a great start. That's what we've seen with the Maker Mobile up in southern Indiana and, and northern Kentucky that we've taken it around to the past two years. People didn't even know that stuff existed. And so once you expose them to it, that's the forerunner of, of what you do next. So you're pushing that technology, you're pushing that curve, you're, and you're introducing that, and you're justifying these tools to be put into schools. A, a big problem is people get these grants and get five or six 3D printers in their school, but then they don't know what to do with them. How do you build that into a curriculum immediately? And so if we can you know, bring the trailer down, show you what we do with it and how we tie it into industry, uh, then we can help you build that curriculum, build that justification for that ask, and once you have that ask, then bring it into the schools. Uh, but it's, it's got to happen quickly because as, as technology is moving so fast, uh, we've got a, a small 3D printer that, that we got at home for, um, I think, down to $300. $300. And you get it home, plug it in, and you're printing stuff instantly. And so th that's what's going to happen with the 3D printers and stuff is it's going to be a home-based product. Uh, right now, there's, there's a company up in, in southern Indiana that helped develop one that's on the space station. So where you might not have the tools or you might not have the products that you need, if you break a knob on the space station, it's really, really expensive to drive back home and get a new one and, and go back to space. So, but you could 3D print one instantly and then you fixed it. And so what might happen is, and what we, we like to um, make a reference to is, is Amazon. If you order a book in some Amazon facilities, they have printing presses in the facility and they actually print the book. They don't want to sit on a bunch of books that they don't know if anybody's going to buy. So textbooks and stuff like that, if you order one, they print it and ship it. So change out the printing press with a 3D printer. You order a new pair of shoes. You print it and ship it. You didn't need a new size, you scale it up, print it and ship it. What the next step is, you want a new color. You just switch out the filaments and you change out the colors. Um, what would happen next would be you have your 3D printer at home and so you download the file. You buy the file from Amazon or you buy the file from whoever and you get the material shipped to you and you print your own pair of shoes. As you change your outfit for today, tomorrow, you say, I think I'm going to wear blue tomorrow. Let's print a blue pair of shoes. I like that style. I like that size. Oh, my foot's, you know, it needs a little bigger as I'm growing. So you change the size and you print it out. So the future could be, I mean, you really are printing your own stuff at home. 
Uh, our little uh, five-year-old and, and two-year-old little boys, they help us pick out a lot of stuff. So when you come on the trailer, you might see all kinds of things printed out there. Like we have a Millennium Falcon, we have a, a movable alligator, we have an octopus, whatever. Um, but it's, you go to bed the night, you pick out your file you want the night before, it prints overnight, and look, you have a new toy. And it really costs, other than the time to print it while you're sleeping, it costs 50 cents, 10 cents, if that. And so, you know, for us, for, for fun things that we do at home, is stuff like that, but that's what's coming. I mean, that's how it's getting out into the community. That's how it's getting out there. People will start having these 3D printers in their home, and you'll be printing your own tools and, and products. So, again, how does that go? You just think about it. You, you look outside the box for innovation. And so these maker spaces, these trailers, these innovative groups and, and community, uh, the colleges, the technical schools, um, you're thinking outside the box as far as who's coming in for the classes and where it's going after the classes. Um, so don't, don't be confined to think that you have to get this specific degree, that you have to get your PhD so that you can redesign this, this thing coming down the line, uh, because there's, there's a whole spectrum of what's needed. Um, and I think, so yeah, and it just, and, it, and if anything else, if you're not a builder, not a creator, just make things for the fun of it. Just, just have fun with it, be creative, because that's what's going to drive the innovation. And so this is the, the picture of the trailer that you guys have here for school. Um, and so it's, they're building it out, they're designing it now. Uh, so I'm sure they would love to talk to you about what they're doing with it. Um, we'd love to base it kind of on what we're doing with the, the Maker Mobile. Um, so get involved with it, support it. If you know a manufacturer in the community, talk to them about it and tell them how they can plug in and get those skilled labors out, uh, out of out of what this is rolling around. Mm -hmm.